Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the challenges of getting food on the tables for families across the United States with special guests, Dr. Melanie Samuel, CEO and founder of the Campaign Against Hunger in New York, Celia Cole, CEO of Feeding Texas, and Monica White, President and CEO of Food Share of Ventura County in California. And a reminder to Zoom attendees that we take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results. And your questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So thank you all. Thank you very much for joining us. One of my great pleasures is I get to speak with people who are way smarter than I am on, on these types of issues. So I'm going to set, uh, set this up and go to Melanie just by saying, over 53 million people in the United States came to food banks last year for help. And the challenge to feed families seems to be growing. In fact, while economists seem to talk about American economy as if it's one thing, we actually have many economies existing side by side. And Melanie is just in a great position to talk about that issue because you live, Melanie, in one of the wealthiest places in the world and also one of the poorest places in the world. Could you talk a little bit about how that actually functions and what you, you, you coined this term food justice. What do you mean by food justice when you're talking about walking down the street and seeing on one side of the street all this wealth and the other side of the street all this poverty existing side by side? Thank you, Mark. And that's a very good question. Honestly, um, the word food justice have been spoken about so many times across our nation, but what does it really mean? And the, who have been really been affected or how do we make changes? Well, for me, when I think of food justice, it's ensuring universal access to healthy, nutritious, culturally appropriate food. And of course, making sure that it is affordable. This whole idea of, of, again, Ventura County, a very uh, interesting uh, place with, with this combination of wealth and poverty. Um, how do you see the problem from your uh, perspective, Melody? We, 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 see the, we see the same thing. I mean, that, in that Ventura County is a very affluent community, um, yet we're serving thousands and thousands of people who are just trying to make ends meet. Um, and that the talk about food justice, you know, that we, we want to be able to ensure that everybody who needs food is able to be able, is able to access it. And whether that be a farm worker and then we need to actually go to the fields to be able to provide to them, or if it's a senior who's homebound, being able to get that food to them, in addition to all of the pantries that we that we operate and ensuring that it's in every single area. So there are no food deserts. So people don't need to travel that far in order to be able to get food. Um, that's all extremely important to us and what we're, we, we struggle with every day. And it's so ironic, right? Farm workers who are actually picking the crops, needing to go to a food bank in order to gain access to the crops or to the diversity of nourishment so that their families can actually survive. Absolutely. And, you know, it's all about timing as well. We used we at the start of pandemic, we were doing a drive through distribution and we thought doing it from two to four would be enough time. Well, we found out that the farm workers weren't getting off in time. And, and so they were unable to access the, even the drive through distribution. So we ended up working with the with the um, with the farmers, um, being able to find out when do they get off and then we bring the food directly to them. And uh, Celia, I see that you're nodding. So th th this story is very familiar to you too, correct? Yes, it is, Mark. And thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Yeah, I want to echo things that Dr. Samuels and Monica have said about food justice. And it really derives, obviously, from USDA's definition of, of what food security means. And I think in Texas, we talk about, you know, right food, right time, right place. And so it's not just about getting food out there, but it's making sure that it gets to the right people and it gets to them in a way that is accessible to them. And I think it's really important to recognize that the people 
growing our food are also struggling with food insecurity. And so the idea of the food justice movement is going beyond the food security movement and really looking at that as well. Um, in Texas, we've run a, a produce initiative for about 20 years now. Um, we call it a win-win-win because we capture rescue surplus produce that's unsellable. That helps farmers. It gives them an outlet for surplus that they would otherwise have to pay to, 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 to dispose of. It also kind of helps them offset some of the losses that we know farmers are, are prone to. It then gets food to hungry people. It improves health. It reduces environmental, environmental hazards of, the, of food waste. Um, but really, I think it, the support that it provides to farmers is really key, and it's part of that food justice concept. So, Mark, I just wanted to add um, to what Cecilia and Monica said in reference to farmers overall. We also look at New York City, and we, we are advocating for the BIPOC farmers because those are the ones that are left behind. Um, we need to see them farm their own land, right? And those that are actually having their space, many of the farmers I know are struggling, especially during the time of COVID. Um, farmers, farmers right now are at risk of losing their property. And so we, we, when we talk about food justice, we wanna ensure also that the farmland goes across the board and that everyone has access, not only any one specific or, um, set of families, but we want to make sure that the farmers overall have access and not only have access has their vehicle and all the, the resources needed to bring food, especially to New York City, where food is so expensive. Well, you're, you're, you're both making a really important point in that we seem to have a systemic issue, not only in the supply chain, but also in the growing and the origination of, of, of the food and where, where we have Farmers, uh, whether it's because they are family farmers or because of, of their location or because of gas prices or because BIPOC farmers have been uh, disadvantaged um, in, in our federal um, farm support programs for uh, so many decades, uh, people are being driven out of business and they are being driven into the food banks because of the loss of, uh, of wealth. Do we have a systemic problem in this issue when it uh, in this country when it comes to the supply chain for food, where we have people who are growing food not able to actually feed themselves and avail themselves of the food that they're growing, as Monica says, um, or do we have um, other issues that really need a, a sort of a rethinking of how food functions in this country? Celia, can you give, can you give it a shot, and then we're going to go around. Uh, to uh, to Melanie and, and Monica. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think when we talk about food security, we're not just talking about individuals um, being food secure, being able to access the food they need to feed their families. We're talking about the overall security of our food system, so to speak. And so whether that's um, at the origin or at points along the supply chain, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely a system that's fraught with lots of problems. And if we're gonna really look at food security holistically and really embrace this concept of food justice, um, that yeah, we do need to look at that disconnect. Uh, Melanie, what do you what do you think about uh, about this in terms of of systemic res uh, responses to what seems to be a systemic problem? Fifty three million people is a huge number, a, a huge amount of our population uh, to be availing itself of, of food banks. Yes, um, I I have to agree with Cecilia, right? And not only that, we have put so much in our health care system. Right, and we've also put money in our food system. But what we have against us, we look at climate change, right? We're right now we're viewing all the problems that are facing the farmers and, and the land issue and gas and all these resources that they need to bring forth. But we also have climate issue that is gonna come into the play. Right now where we are, uh, um, grain is very hard to get. And I know that there has been, with Ukraine and Russia, there's been a change over, but nevertheless, it has not trickled down yet. So what you're finding, for instance, the campaign against hunger, we have been work serving um, New York City for 24 years. In the height of the pandemic, we found ourselves in a place where we had to literally change our model in order to get food to families. We have built a new model in New York City that has been adopted by so many robust pantries. It's no longer robust pantries. 
We are now in a different place. Why are we doing this? Because we recognize that when disaster hits, not only are farmers um, accessible um, um, to the disaster itself, they find themselves being impacted by the disaster, but um, city-wide urban families, families working poor, um, and everyone else is being affected. And so what happens is, especially during the pandemic, it took us weeks, and I, I mean weeks, to get food in. Unbelievable, but it took us weeks and the cost of food. So now we have to really look at the food system. What was built is not working. Let's just all face it. The way it's been done, it's not working. It's now time for us to look at what works best and start investing in what works best so that we can put food insecurity behind us. We can alleviate it by working together and, and look at exactly what is on the table and let those that have the skill set and the know-how join together and come up with a solution. And I'm talking universal. I'm talking nation, national, right? And, and I think some of that would help to work on the problem we're presently facing. Is, is, is part of this sort of connecting the dots between health and food, is part of this how we've been thinking about food? We seem to in this country have encouraged kind of a monoculture of, of food uh, supply chain based in corn, for example, based in wheat, very few crops. And as the uh, climate gets hotter, um, the climate is less hospitable to, uh, to certain of those crops, right? Corn does not thrive as well in uh, water. Um, uh, uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a drought tolerant uh, uh, crop. Uh, Monica, as you're looking at the situation that you're that you're facing, and uh, taking Melanie's point about grains, for example, the prices of grains going up, and the and the kind of um, in fuel intensive farming that we do, which means that gas prices are having a disproportionate uh, impact on the entire food supply chain. Do you see? And, and we're going to talk a little bit about sort of what you do to alleviate immediate need. Do you see a rethinking that we as citizens ought to be undertaking in terms of our own consumption habits, our own supply chain, how we think about these things, uh, government, nonprofits? Is this, a, is this an all in kind of a call to action at this point? Uh, yes, the latter. It's all in. <laughs> there's not there's not one uh, silver bullet that's going to that's going to solve all of it. And it is it's the combination of all of those. Um, and I, I think it's so wonderful that we have a we have a New York and we have Ventura County, three thousand miles apart. Um, we are in a, the agricultural uh, center of 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 California, and that we have so much produce that we can't use it all. Um, and so, get it to but, market right. I mean, it's just it's just basically rotting in the is. fields. It can't so, be picked. It can't be moved. Right. Right. And so that brings up uh, this issue of that. So um, we're part of the California Association of Food Banks, as well as Feeding America. And the food banks have put together a farm to family program, which is um, which ex which um, uh, accesses um, additional produce. And so we say, for, you know, farming to to access, we want to be able to grab, grab, grab all of that additional produce and be able to get it to the food banks who are, who can use it. I'll give you strawberries, for example. We have more strawberries than we're, we're able to use. We're right by the port of Wainini. Sometimes we'll get literally tons of pineapple or bananas that we that will that will go bad before we're able to even use them. So we have so, fertilizer, we have labor, we have land, we have water. It's all been invested in creating this pineapple, creating this strawberry. Don't have anybody to pick it. Right. We have or, a or the transportation to get it to them. So we have New York who is saying, I will take all of your extra strawberries, all of your extra bananas. But the cost of getting something from one end to the other is what is really prohibitive. And it went and it skyrocketed during um, during COVID. And it's really stayed up there. And what cost is seven hundred dollars for a truckload is now fifteen hundred dollars which well, means that affects the food banks and how much food we can actually purchase. You need the drivers and, and so on and so forth. We have a labor problem, right? And, and we also have this sort of gamesmanship going on in the Southern border states in terms of, of not basically being overwhelmed by, by a huge number of illegal Im immigrants because we haven't figured out a way to provide work visas to these people who could actually work 
in agriculture, for example, where there is a tr tremendous need. Celia, how do you see these interconnected elements? Isn't there something? Because this is not a political party thing. This should, I mean, this is an American thing. We should all be able to come together and say, you know, agriculture needs labor. We need to get things from one place to another. How do we come together? It just seems to me to be kind of nonsensical that everybody's sort of throwing darts at each other rather than solving problems. Yeah, and I mean, what Monica was talking about with their farm to family initiative, there's, you know, similar um, collaboratives around the country uh, of involving food banks and regional efforts to rescue produce. And I think one of the benefits of us all being part of Feeding America is they're trying to provide some of that, uh, that um, the connecting of dots between those different, you know, where there's supply and where there's demand and trying to help us address some of the transportation issues. But one thing, I mean, I think it's really good that we're all here together talking about long-term solutions and the bigger picture and the systemic problems. But I mean, food banks in the meantime, you all will, you'll resonate with this, I think. I mean, we have to deal with the immediate problem of people being hungry. Um, and so while we're working to kind of fix the system, we also have to deal with um, the casualties of the system. And so one thing I don't want to get lost in all of this is we're talking about food security and farm security, et cetera, is income security. And, and really, when you talk about hunger, it's not so much a food problem as it is a money problem. And so when people are coming to food banks for help, um, it, they don't have the money to afford food on their own. And there are food deserts in many poor areas of the country, but there are, if, you, if you look at what it means to be in a food desert, it's really about can you access a, a grocery store that has affordable food. And there's plenty of wealthier communities in this country that could qualify under that definition, but the difference is, is that people there have the money. And so if it's not easy for them to access food nearby, they can order online, they can travel to the Whole Foods that's 10 miles away, but when it comes to the people we serve, uh, the reason that they're facing hunger, it's it's a, it's an income problem. They don't have adequate resources to afford food. So I think you know hunger is a very intersectional issue. We've talked about some of the intersections, but really figuring out how to um, improve income security in this country, reduce uh, income inequality, I think is also really key here. So let's talk a little bit and see if you could cont continue on because you you mentioned the fact that um, we have an immediate problem. We have a systemic issue. And we, we've talked about income, we've talked about labor, we've talked about the cost of trucking, fuel, inflation, all these different, these different issues. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the immediate problem. So if you can continue, and then we're gonna go to, to Melanie, uh, talk about actually what you do every single day in order to deal with somebody who is hungry, whose kids are, are really in distress to start to alleviate that distress. Sure. Well, I mean, right now about one in eight Texans suffers from food insecurity. And obviously that number skyrocketed during the pandemic. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Samuels mentioned earlier the sort of need for the food, the charitable food assistance system to really reinvent itself to be able to meet that increased need. And while some of it's come down um, with the pandemic easing into an endemic situation, we're now seeing obviously the impacts of inflation that are hitting people and food banks because those rising costs of, in, in fuel and fertilizer, you know, that's also affecting um, obviously the people growing food and the, and the food banks. Um, so it's a, it's a really enormous problem. I mean, we're seeing millions of Texans daily who are struggling to afford food. And I think, you know, one of our food banks has sort of coined the saying, you know, food for today, food for tomorrow, food for life, and figuring out how to build food bank services around that so that, you know, the, the, the bread and butter, no pun intended of what we do is meeting that immediate need with the food box. And it's hopefully a a really uh, diverse food box that includes lots of fresh fruits and vegetables and other things that, that people need to be immediately uh, meeting their nutritional needs. But we know that most people come to us, it's not a one-time need, it's not just a, an immediate crisis, it's an ongoing crisis, it's chronic food insecurity. We know that most people come to us six or seven times a year. Um, and so what can we do to sort of, uh, you know, a, a tackle the food for tomorrow when they leave our food pantry? We know that the food's going to only last so long and that they're going to continue to have need. Um, so we work very closely with the state agency that administers the SNAP program, formerly the food stamp program, to connect the eligible families that are coming to us for immediate help to that ongoing assistance, because we know that SNAP is the most, the largest and most important anti-hunger fighting program in this country. Um, and then along with that, getting them connected to other services like Medicaid, um, 
uh, long-term care services. If they're really poor in Texas, you can qualify for, for the welfare program. So getting them connected to cash assistance if they're eligible, um, just to kind of stabilize and provide that food to, for tomorrow. And then food for life is really about, I think, working closely with um, our partners across the nonprofit system, whether it's in healthcare or um, uh, workforce development, um, housing, to make sure that those sort of um, systemic drivers of food insecurity, those sort of upstream causes that we work very closely with them to figure out, okay, what else do the people coming to us for immediate food aid need in terms of, um, you know, getting a better job, finding more stable housing, de dealing with an underlying health issue. Um, so that's the piece that I think food banks have been tackling, you know, at least for a decade now, but really where um, it, it's, it's, it's newer for us and it really involves uh, building um, deep and uh, wide partnerships across the nonprofit spectrum. And Melanie, you started your whole organization, your whole approach with this sort of integrative idea at the intersection of justice and food, haven't you? Yes, I have. And um, to us, dignity is important. Um, the only difference with what I've just heard is that we have implemented other things. We look at workforce program as a key part of um, food justice. We have a robust workforce program. We have youths that, in other words, we are fighting crime by using our workforce program, food. Um, we also have implemented areas where um, online cyber, cyber pantries. And now we have families because what it is is that you have those that work sometimes 70 plus, but yet struggle because of the cost of living in New York City. So one would say someone or, or two people together making 70 plus dollars per year is why would you need a food pantry? But that, that's not so in New York City. The cost of living, the cost of homes have increased exponentially. And so we find that many families are coming and some want to come, but, but they are somewhat shying away because they're a little ashamed. You know, they still have a car, they're a little ashamed. So what we've done, we've implemented an online system that they never have to come in yet. We have a um, partnership with DoorDash where we do door to um, shop and deliver like the Amazon style. So that has worked out. We have seen a vast increase in that. Um, the campaign against hunger on a whole served 14,000 families every week. We have dispersed during the uh, pandemic over 30 million meals, which is an enormous amount beyond even our capacity. But what we have done is that we saw the need that instead of where we were working, we had to find a much larger space, both in Brooklyn and in Queens. And by doing that, we believe that we have really strengthened um, how we have approached food insecurity because we build partners on the ground. Whereas most food banks bring their food to us, we're saying that we will go to individuals, not just to an organization, but we'll, we'll find leaders in our community that knows their community, know the senior that is hungry, the, the single mother, those that are disabled, know those that are most vulnerable. And what we will do is turn around and ensure that these families, so by building um, great partnership is, is, a, is a unique way of fighting hunger. It's food justice on the whole, getting the right produce in, right? Also looking overall at our food system to see how best can we reach. I know we talked about traveling and the cost. So we are now, we have been doing a lot of hydroponics. We're looking at that as another way. Right now we grow over 20,000, we're growing 20,000 pounds, about 20,000 pounds of food. We see in the next, um, by 2025, um, that we will be able to triple or quadruple that number by the method that we're using, but also increasing, like I talk about workforce program. Talk, we talk about um, educating our, our community to make choices. It's very difficult. We run farmer's market, mobile farmer's market, where the cost is exceptionally low so that families can access healthy food. Whereas farmer's market on a whole, they're great, but most times people who are living in poverty cannot shop there. They have to go back to the supermarket and supermarkets are very rare in our community. Um, families are used to, they, but they, I think it's 
is so fascinating here is that these are all citizen initiatives, right? This is not government. This is basically citizen initiatives. And we've just completed uh, a few polls. Uh, one is that 80% uh, of the people who responded said that they um, have either themselves or uh, know someone else who have access to food, a food bank. That's 80%. And then we talked about solving the problem um, in a systemic way. Um, 63% said that government and policymakers have the primary role, and nobody said that this wasn't a problem. Was, everybody recognized this is a, this is a problem. And then in terms of the change in the system, it's interesting. 40%, um, the, the highest number of answers came from increasing income, the minimum wage in particular. So we, were, we asked, you know, um, uh, what would be the most helpful change in the U.S. to create a more equitable food system? And we had questions about decreasing food waste, more funding for food banks, and so on. But the most answers were given to a, a wage issue. Monica, um, when you look at, at your situation here, um, do you get your food from businesses and if you get those the food from businesses, how does that actually work? Are people just contributing their uh, the 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 uh, food that they can't bring to market? Um, how do they? How do you ensure that your supply remains robust given that the needs is seem to be unending? Yeah, that food um, sourcing is the number one um, issue for every single food bank because without food, we would be completely irrelevant. So we, we work with um, every single retail outlet in Ventura County. Everybody has their own territory because every day there's food that is, they're no longer able to sell, but is still perfectly good. So we rescue was what we call it. We rescue all of that food. But then we also work with packing houses. We work with, um, as I said, the port. We work with farmers. Um, anybody who has any food within our territory, um, we're in constant contact with them and we're there to be able to pick up anything the minute that it is available. We also purchase um, only about 20% of our food, which is way up from when uh, pre-pandemic. Um, but we also um, have the government, um, USDA provides through the Farm Bill, they provide, it's called TFAP, the Emergency Food Assistance Program that goes to low income um, of, uh, community members. So you have basically, again, an all-in kind of a kind of an activity here. You have um, retail outlets, you have the growers uh, getting involved, you have members of community, you have government involved, and then of course you have your army of volunteers involved. So people are basically wow. trying to take an all an all-in approach. How often do you have political arguments in that process? Or <laughs> all from all stripes. No, I'm serious, because we seem to always focus on on what divides us. But you have people who are working for common cause across all different parts of the political spectrum. We should function like that as a country, shouldn't we, Monica? Uh, yes, I, I completely agree. Um, we actually we don't we don't see that here. Um, we all work very closely. We all work very well together because we're all in this going for the same mission. We all have the same end uh, goal in mind is to be able to, if there is food, we're gonna get it to the nearest food bank, we're gonna get it to the nearest pantry. Um, as long as it is going to someone in need, um, we consider that a win. Um, but you know, I, I, I kind of wanted to go back to when we were talking about policy um, in that it, it, about the government, it being their responsibility. Um, SNAP is incredibly important to all of our food banks. Um, what we do is just is is much smaller than what SNAP provides. We provide one meal for every nine meals that SNAP provides. So you know, public policy and advocacy is just is huge for us um, to be able to ensure that that farm bill you know continues and that those government commodities come through. Um, th that's that is huge for us. So what you're saying is that part of a government's responsibility is to actually support those people who don't have power, who don't necessarily have the means. It's basically our responsibility, those people who do have means as taxpayers to take care of our, uh, of other members of the American family, isn't it? It's reality. It, that is what that is what it is right now. And as the food banks, we're the safety net. <clears throat> we're underneath 
um, that that program, that if anybody falls through that in the end of the month, let's just say that they don't qualify for SNAP and we keep them from being homeless because we are able to provide them with food so they can pay their mortgage, they can pay their rent, they can keep their cars. Um, so we're that very last safety net um, beneath all of those um, huge government programs. So if you care about homelessness encampments, make sure that, that people don't have to become homeless because they can't afford to put a put food on their on their plate. Uh, Melanie, um, I'd like to give you a word and then uh, Celia will will give uh, Texas the last word. Uh, but Melanie, how do you see how we should function here? How do you see us taking the lessons that you've learned and taking them to heart as a country and and start acting together to solve this problem once and for all? I, I truly believe it's important for us to work together. And um, I have seen such a difference and quickly saying that what how food insecurity was approached years ago, I've really seen a light at the end of the tunnel. And I believe that we're going in the right directions and we can make a change in, in, in the method. We're looking at what works and it's working. I appreciate my governor, I appreciate my, my mayor and those that are in all the legislative officers because they work well with us and they want to know what's going on in their community and they have been a voice in the community against food insecurity. My neighbors and friends are working also. So we find that in New York City, although there is a longer, maybe a longer line than anywhere else, uh, we are really addressing the problem the best way we have. Right now, it's a little difficult. We, in the next two months, we are really struggling overall because there seem to be very little resources. So right now, there's a struggle. But I, I do look at the end of the tunnel in a few years to come, and I think that a lot of our services will have made a vast difference in the lives of families, and there is positive changes to come. And Celia, how do you see us solving this this issue or do you see this issue as being something that we as Americans can actually solve? Oh definitely. I mean I think we often say, you know, you know, hunger is a problem that we can we can uh, you know can't afford to ignore. We can't afford to solve. You know, it's not um I don't think it's an intractable intractable problem. Um, I think one of the reasons um, that it's so important to ensure that people are nourished um, is that getting food to people, feeding people, that's kind of a low cost solution when you when you compare it to the cost of the consequences, which is, you know, whether it's poor health or homelessness. I think that the, those problems down the chain are a lot, uh, a lot more complicated and more expensive to solve. Um, it's not that expensive or hard to figure out how to get food to people. And I think that's why even in Texas, which is a very um, polarized state right now, um, we have support across the political spectrum for making sure that we keep Texans fed. And we saw this throughout the pandemic. People understood that, you know, if we could at a minimum keep people fed, um, that it was going to be a lot easier to keep those families resilient throughout the pandemic. So you know, I, I think you're making a very, very important point. We are in every state divided, including in Texas, including in California, including throughout the United States, but we don't need to be. We have problems, we can solve them, right? We have a labor shortage in this country. We have uh, people who wanna come to this country. We should come together and figure out some sort of rational approach to deal with this stuff instead of uh, uh, scoring political points. The borders need to be secured, of course, but we also need people to do work in the fields. We need people who will get those crops to market. We need the energies of the, of the entire country to come together to solve these kinds of problems. Dr. Melanie Samuels, CEO and founder of the Campaign Against Hunger in New York, Celia Cole, CEO of Feeding Texas, Monica White, President and CEO of Food Share of Ventura County in California, you are our heroes. Your people are our heroes. You are solving practical problems instead of wasting time in fruitless debates and, and, uh, and point scoring. Please thank your boards. Thank your suppliers. Thank your funders. Thank your staffs. And, and thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today.